Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is Grim Trigger, a particular type of strategy in an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. Yes, we have completed all of the groundwork necessary to be able to solve infinitely repeated games, and that's what we're going to be attempting to do here. To quickly recall the prisoner's dilemma that we've been looking at, these are the payoffs of a particular prisoner's dilemma, the stage game of our infinitely repeated game. And unlike the finite prisoner's dilemma, the particular payoffs of an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma matter quite a bit. So there are the payoffs to refresh your memory. I will be bringing this back up as we go, so if you forget what's going on here, no worries. All right, so let's go ahead and try solving an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. There's actually one equilibrium that we know straight off the bat. Inefficiency is still possible, even if we have infinite repetition, and that's because the defect-defect outcome in the stage game of A Prisoner's Dilemma is the unique Nash equilibrium of that stage game, and we know from a theorem before on repeated games that playing a stage game Nash equilibrium in every period is an equilibrium, a subgame perfect equilibrium, of an overall game when you repeat it. And that's true whether the game is of finite repetition or infinite repetition. So we know in this infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, if we're both defecting all the way through, then that's an equilibrium to the game and it's inefficient. But like before, that doesn't necessarily imply that that's the only equilibrium that could be existing in an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma. It turned out in the finitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, this mutual defection was the only equilibrium. But fortunately for us here, in this infinitely repeated game, you can get cooperation as well. And the particular type of cooperation we're going to be looking for is inspired by something known as a grim trigger strategy. Grim Trigger takes the following method to inspire cooperation. It says that if anyone has defected at any point previously in the game, you defect forever. Otherwise, you cooperate. So if you're actually in this game, if you've decided to adopt a Grim Trigger strategy, at the start of the game, no one has defected previously, no one has even had the opportunity to do that, so by the Grim Trigger strategy, you cooperate. And then in the second stage... As long as everyone else cooperated in the first stage, including yourself, then you cooperate in the second stage. And in the third stage, if everyone cooperated in both the first and the second stage, you continue to cooperate, and so forth. Grim Trigger is saying, I will play nice to you as long as you have played nice to me in the past and you haven't tried to do anything deceitful to me. However, at the very first misstep, if you were to ever defect on me, then I will defect on you forever. This is a good place to look to see if we can get cooperation to occur, because if this is not sufficient to inspire cooperation, nothing at all can. There is no punishment strategy more egregious and bloodthirsty than the Grim Trigger strategy, because it is saying even a single misstep from the opponent will result in defection forever. So if that's not scary enough to convince the other side to cooperate under the threat of that punishment, nothing else is going to be good enough. And, as it turns out, this works. But to show that it works, we have to look at two separate conditions. First, we need to check to see that if a defection has been triggered previously, is it an equilibrium to continue defection forever? And second, if no one has defected previously, would anyone want to? So if we have two players both adopting a Grim Trigger strategy, we have essentially two phases of the game. In one phase of the game, no one has defected previously, so we're cooperating. And then in the second stage of the game, someone has previously defected, and so we're defecting forever. You can think about this as a defection stage and a cooperation stage. Point one is the defection stage, point two is the cooperation stage. We need to check in both of these stages, or both of these phases of the game, if an individual would want to deviate from the Grim Trigger strategy, conditional on the other player also adopting that Grim Trigger strategy. So let's think about the defection phase first. This is actually the easiest part to solve. In fact, we've done this already. If we were to ever arrive in the defection stage or the defection phase of the game, if we're both defecting on each other forever, think about the subgame that we have started defecting on each other, well, 
That's a subgame that consists of an infinitely repeated prisoner's dilemma, and we know that playing the stage game Nash Equilibrium of a game that's being infinitely repeated is an equilibrium itself. So we are done with this first point. If we are both defecting on each other forever, the best response I have to you defecting on me forever is to defect on you forever, and vice versa. So if we ever reach this defection stage or this defection phase, that's it. We're good to go on that. There can't be any cooperation that's going to occur once we've reached that defection stage. I would not want to deviate. You would not want to deviate. We're good. So the lingering question is the second condition. This is the cooperation phase. So imagining that no one has defected previously, we're supposed to be continuing to cooperate with one another. Do you or I have any incentive to switch from that strategy and go look for something else? Some sort of defection, which may result in some more defection and so forth. Well, this would ordinarily seem to be a very challenging condition to check because we need to look for all sorts of deviations, not just deviating at one particular point, but deviating from the equilibrium strategy all over the place, both in the cooperation phase and in the defection phase. Fortunately, though, some of the mechanics that we've learned previously tells us that we don't need to worry about this. It's the one-shot deviation principle to the rescue. We don't need to care about complex deviations to check to see if something is a subgame perfect equilibrium. We only need to check whether a player would not want to deviate in each of the cooperation periods. So if it's the case that we're in period one, and you wouldn't want to defect in period one, conditional on the other player adopting a grim trigger strategy, so we're both cooperating, or at least we're both supposed to be cooperating in this first stage, then that's good. Then we need to check to see if we're in stage two or period two of the game and we're still in this cooperation phase, so we had mutual cooperation in the first stage. Is it true that you don't want to deviate to defecting in that second stage? And then we need to check the third stage and fourth stage and fifth stage and so forth. So this still seems a little bit complicated, bearing in mind that there are actually infinitely many periods to the game. But as it turns out, it really all boils down to a single equation, which we're now going to cover. Let's think about whether you would want to deviate in that very first period. If you're playing a Grim Trigger strategy, and the other player is playing a Grim Trigger strategy as well, your equilibrium payoff is going to be 3 in the first stage, 3 in the second stage, 3 in the third stage, and so forth, discounting appropriately. That's because in the Grim Trigger strategy, you start out by cooperating, and as long as everyone is cooperating before, which is going to happen, you continue to get your cooperation payoff which as you recall from your payoff matrix on your screen right now, is a value of three. I'm gonna be looking at the decision for player one to deviate or not, but because this game is symmetric, it's the same decision for player two. So if we have the player sticking to the equilibrium strategies and player one not defecting, he is going to receive a payoff of three forever, discounted appropriately throughout that entire interaction. The other choice for player one is to defect in this first stage, because we're only looking at this first period deviation. If player one defects in the first stage, he receives a payoff of four for that first period. That's because player two is playing a grim trigger strategy, so she's starting out by cooperating. And player one is essentially betraying her trust and choosing to defect instead. So instead of receiving a payoff of three for this period, he receives a payoff of four instead. So that's slightly better for him for this first period. However, Grim Trigger has this threat of punishment. By defecting in the first stage, player one now receives a lower payoff for all future stages. He gets a payoff of two in the second stage, two in the third stage, two in the fourth stage, and so forth, once again, discounted appropriately. That's because we shift from the cooperation phase of the game to the defection phase, and now player one is receiving a payoff of two as opposed to the three he would have gotten would have been getting from cooperation. So to check to see whether player one could profitably deviate in this first stage, we need to essentially be looking at this inequality. This is comparing the equilibrium payoff to the payoff for the deviation where you defect in the first stage. So player one would want to continue cooperating as the grim trigger strategy suggests that he should do if this condition holds.
Now, this would seem to be very difficult to solve for because we have dot, dot, dots on both sides. We have an infinite stream of payoffs on both sides. But you'll remember back to the lecture on geometric series, we know of a very convenient way of rewriting this. Instead of having the payoffs be written like this, we can combine those streams of payoffs together so that the left side of the inequality is a simple geometric series. You take the base payoff of three that's being repeated over and over and over again, and you divide that by one minus the discount factor. The right side of the inequality, well, you get a payoff of four. That's the only four that appears there, so that's by itself. And then after that, you get a payoff of two times the discount factor, then a payoff of two squared times the discount factor, and so forth. One of the formulas I gave you in that lecture on geometric series was what your payoff looked like for receiving the same payoff in every stage of the game except for the first stage, which is to take the base payoff here, which is two, and then multiply that by the discount factor and divide by one minus the discount factor. So that's how we're getting that payoff there. If this is unfamiliar to you, you should go back and look at the geometric series lecture to understand where this is coming from. Otherwise, it's going to seem like I'm pulling this out of thin air when in fact there's actual mathematics behind why we can rewrite it like this. All right, from here, we have a simple inequality to work with. It seems that the decision to be willing to continue to cooperate depends on this delta. Everything else is just a number, but we have deltas floating around in here, so it appears that this inequality depends on that value of delta. So let's do some algebra and see if we can solve for delta, essentially get delta on one side all by itself. Well, we can do that by, for example, first multiplying everything by one minus delta, we could then distribute that four. All I'm doing here is algebra. We can then group the numbers on one side and the deltas on the other side. And that would get us to two delta is greater than one. And then we can divide off that two. And so we get finally that you would want to be, or you'd at least be willing to continue cooperating, maintaining that equilibrium groom trigger strategy as long as delta is greater than one half. If delta is less than one half, then you would have, in fact, this strict preference to want to deviate. So we can't have grim trigger be sustained if delta is less than one half. But as long as delta is greater than or equal to one half, we're good to go on the grim trigger, at least for the first stage. Now here's where we do some mathematical wizardry. Turns out that all of the calculations that we just did to show that you wouldn't want to deviate in this first period, that same argument applies to all other periods in a cooperation phase of A Prisoner's Dilemma, where both players are playing the Grim Trigger strategy. The reason is as follows. Think about what the comparison we need to be making is. If we have played a few rounds before, your payoff for continuing to cooperate as long as we're in this cooperation phase, once again, is whatever you got before, which is a sunk payoff because you can't change that, plus your payoff for this particular stage, which is going to be, if you're mutually cooperating, a payoff of three, and then in the next stage you get another payoff of three, and so forth, discounted appropriately. So we've had many periods where we've already been playing, that's a sunk payoff, and then in this period, I receive a payoff of three times delta to the n to represent my discounting up until this period, and so forth. My comparison is what would happen if I were to deviate to defecting in this particular period. Well, I still receive the same sunk payoffs before. That's because they have already happened. So if I defect in this particular stage, that doesn't change what my payoffs were previously. I've already accrued them. Yeah, it can't be changed at this point. So instead, in this one particular period where we're now starting the explicit payoff, I get a payoff of four for that period, discounted appropriately to delta to the n. And then from there on, we have this mutual defection forever, which uh, rather results in this increasing discount factor with twos every single time. Okay? Well, in this particular stage, this arbitrary, this arbitrary, this general phase of the game, is it the case that you would want to cooperate here? Well, we can solve for this inequality and figure that out. We can first, instead of having these sunk payoffs float around, we can get rid of those. We can subtract the sunk payoffs from both sides because, again, they have occurred previously, so they're identical on either side, and the strategy that we're thinking about in this particular period can't affect them. 
Another thing that we can do is get rid of a lot of these deltas. There's a delta to the n in each and every one of these particular values all floating out throughout the inequality. So if we divide everything by delta to the n power, we're left with an, rather an inequality that looks like this. And you'll remember from before, this is the exact same inequality that we were looking at when we were thinking about whether you would want to deviate in the first period or not. And this should make sense if you think about it. If we reach an arbitrary stage of the cooperation phase of the game, this is like playing the game for the first time, except that we've accrued payoffs before. But if we standardize the payoffs for now, with the discount factor, essentially dividing everything by delta to the n, we've reached the same payoffs, essentially, as what we would have been looking at in the first stage. So we know that this inequality will hold as long as delta is greater than or equal to one half. So as a result, we can conclude that Grim Trigger works in this particular game with this prisoner's dilemma with the payoffs that we had in that particular matrix, as long as delta is greater than or equal to one half. A couple of quick comments before we conclude here. First, cooperation will only work here if the actors are sufficiently patient. And here in particular, that means delta is greater than or equal to one half. This actually makes sense if you think about it. Delta represents how much we care about the future as compared to today, with larger values of delta representing more care about the future and smaller values of delta representing less care about the future. Grim Trigger is trying to trade cooperation throughout time in exchange for good behavior. I'm using the leverage, the threat of defection forever to convince you not to defect today. Your trade-off is to take a one-shot gain for today by defecting and getting that really good payoff for you for that one stage now and suffering for the rest of time. So if you're suffering for the rest of time and you don't care very much about the future, cooperating today looks less attractive because you could defect and take that extra gain now and sacrifice the future that you don't really care very much about. And so that's why we only get this grim trigger to work when the actors are sufficiently patient, when they believe that this prisoner's dilemma is going to be repeating for a long time. Secondly, Kind of weird, but also cool, that cooperation will work in the infinite game, as long as the discount factor is sufficiently high, but not an arbitrarily long finite game. Even if you have a finite game that consists of a trillion periods, you still don't get cooperation to occur. You need to switch over to an infinite horizon game in order for cooperation to succeed. Okay, so that's Grim Trigger strategy for you. It's not the only type of strategy that can be used to get cooperation to occur in a repeated prisoner's dilemma. And in fact, perhaps a more famous one than Grim Trigger is something called tit for tat, and that will be the subject of the next lecture. Hope you enjoy this, and hope to see you next time. Take care.